The Souls of Roach Folk, on Terra Formars, Fascism, and the State of Western Anime Fandom. Hello, and welcome back to Most Home for Jesus and Hot Takes. Uh, anime. On the one hand, beautiful animation, wonderful characters, heartfelt stories that really speak to the human condition, that make us laugh, that make us cry, that make us bond together as human beings. On the other end, fascism. Like, far more fascism than you would expect from a medium whose fans desperately hope and claim is apolitical. And that's what we're going to talk about today with Terraformars, so make sure to like and subscribe, follow me on YouTube and Medium. Without further ado, let's get into it. Content warnings this time around include extremely racist imagery and rhetoric, gore, Ben Shapiro, and bad writing. So if any of these would ruin your day and or mental health, I would suggest, you know, may- maybe skip this one. It's fine. It's cool. It's, it's all right. You're 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 more important than Terraformars, that's for sure. <laughs> This is Section 1. Part 0. Introduction. In the beginning, there was peace. There was nothing. Weaves and weeblets suckled from the nectared bosom of the anime goddess for however long they please, binging show after show after show. They cherished their ships and their waifus, and their headcanons in reckless abandon. Civilization was at its peak. The people held conventions adorned with opulent cosplays for the world to regard with envy. Fan art bloomed across the land in abundance. Politics, that dreaded word, that heinous word, was nowhere to be found. The world was as it should be. That is, until one cursed day. A devil arose from the darkness in the form of an electric mouse. He spoke. Behold, for a show released five years ago is racist as fuck. Okay, but seriously though, Terraformars is just about the worst thing that exists, and I'm about to make us think about it again. Nope, you don't get a choice in this. Sorry, it's happening now. We're doing it. We're making it happen. Look, it's either this, or I add another Joker take to the radioactive pile of garbage thinking up the internet, so shut up. We're doing this. A rather unappreciated advantage of the internet is the ability to step through past discourse. It may take a historian to figure out what the average Pennsylvanian thought of the end of Reconstruction, but armed with Google, the Wayback Machine, and a hazmat suit, anyone can wade through Twitter and relive the rousing discourse surrounding the release of, I don't know, like, fully coolly progressive or something. Or maybe good old Terraformars. How'd that one turn out? Terraformars is no stranger to criticism of anime fans. The show has no idea how to tell a story. The first season is horribly rushed, skipping development and character interaction to get right to what it considers the highlights, blood and gore and boobs. Despite its lightning pace, however, these 13 episodes 
in total take 24 hours of in-show time. A lot of images flash across the screen, but nothing much actually happens. The second season, by contrast, takes things slower. So slowly that everything drags. Apparently, when the writing staff heard the show could take its time to explain its characters more, it took that as cut to a flashback every five seconds and tell the audience what we should really be showing them instead. Every scene has so much weight and gravitas attached to it, but you don't care enough about the cast for it to affect you in any way. It's these issues, plus the show's overall lack of a plot that makes sense, that nets the first season the relatively low mal score of 7.1, and the second season the abysmal rating of 6.83. Just to put that into perspective, Waddington and Angel Flew Down to Me is literally just the story of a pedophile in college who grooms her fifth grade sister's best friend. She bribes the kids with candy and cake so she doesn't get the fucking police called on her. 7.52 on Mel. Terraformars is five years old, out of the limelight, and aside from the handful of dedicated fans scattered across the internet, no one really talks about it anymore. So, why the treatise? Because as was the case with the Rising of the Shield hero, and as I expect to be the case for many of the shows I end up writing about, anime fans are easy to accept these kinds of mechanical, apolitical criticisms of anime. If you try or even hint at the disgusting and obvious bigotry and propaganda on display from the first scene of the first season to the last, if you bring its disturbing source material out into open, anime fans band together and defend the show from any kind of criticism. The result? For the past five years, Terraformers has just been, like, stinking up the place. It hasn't received a thorough critique or breakdown since it was converted to an anime. The show exists as part of modern anime canon without so much as an asterisk. When Kotaku... Remember, Kotaku is supposed to be that hyper-liberal SJW site that thinks everything is problematic. When Kotaku reviewed the show in 2014, it had nothing but praise for Terraformars. Writing, Straight up, Terraformars is high-octane entertainment. Lots of cool action and captivating plot twists out of nowhere. Right from the start, the manga picks up and doesn't stop, and it's a hell of an entertaining ride. This was added as an additional note, after the piece was originally published. A friend of mine pointed out to me that they thought the depiction of the humanoid cockroaches in Terraformars was racist against black people. While this does not lessen my overall impressions of the manga, as I do not feel it's intentional, it may be worth mentioning for those who feel sensitive. And in fact, the latter quote encapsulates the real discussion around the show. Terraformers as a manga, and as an ill-fated anime adaptation, in a worse live-action movie, has been flagged by many people, especially people of color, as problematic. And every time, it's the same condescending response. It's fine. It's not on purpose. Don't be sensitive. <laughs> Don't be sensitive, coming from white people who don't have to deal with this shit, who don't have to deal with the fact that you can count all the lead characters who look like you on one hand, and who don't have to share a fandom where the majority of people neither understand what makes life different for you, or care enough about you to have their narrow perceptions of the world challenged. When I put on my hazmat suit and use the wonderful power of the internet to journey through time and space back to the release of the show, all I saw were persistent attempts to get dissenters to stay quiet about the parts of this show that really matter. It was, don't be so sensitive, again and again until today, the largest written criticism on this medium is a WordPress blog and someone's old tweet. I refuse to let my experiences as a black person, or the experiences of any other minority just trying to watch fucking anime without the medium and its fans secreting toxicity all over our essences, to be reduced to some afterthought. I am about to shit all over the legacy of this worthless piece of garbage of a story. I am digging up its corpse and defiling its grave. As you'll soon see, it does not deserve to be forgotten as some Attack on Titan knockoff with pacing issues. Terraformars deserves nothing. At the end of the day, though, it's more than just calling a thing I don't like bad. 
there is a clear lack of understanding within the anime fandom as to what kinds of ideas its media can propagate and how those ideas are used and continue to be used to hurt people and prop up injustice around the world. Part 1. The Obvious, aka These Aren't Black People, I Swear. The premise of Terraformars is as follows. Back in the 21st century, humanity began the process of terraforming Mars as a solution to overpopulation, adding first greenhouse gases and water, then algae and the first animal species, cockroaches. 500 years later, this process is complete. A rover is sent to inspect the planet and learn if it's ready to host human life, but the machine is destroyed. During the 500 years since humanity left Mars to develop, the cockroaches sent there have evolved into humanoid-like creatures hostile to humanity. Tensions rise between humanity and this new race of creatures called terraformars. A manned mission to Mars brings back a deadly and contagious virus that's keen on eliminating all human life on Earth. The year is roughly 2600. The UN space body, known as UNASA, created largely out of NASA, sends a scientific vessel called the Annex-1 to Mars to procure 100 live samples of the virus to help American scientists develop a cure. The Annex-1 is the latest in a new wave of Terran missions to Mars following the failed Bugs-1 and Bugs-2 missions. Each crew, made up of mainly orphan teens and 20-somethings in debt, has had their genes spliced with an insect or some other organism, giving them each a unique ability in combat. Armed with superpowers, they must fight their way through the hostile natives to survive and bring back enough virus samples to save the human race. Not a bad premise for a sci-fi romp. I mean, okay, some of you can tell that this story is problematic from its very premise, but not any more problematic than is the case for most sci-fi and fantasy kind of stories. But uh, the first problem, these humanoid cockroaches look like fucking this. When people complain about the racism of terraformars, this is usually what they're talking about. If you're a fan during that time, you probably remember the discourse around this as well, as it's basically the only thing that ever gets touched. The designs of the roaches are not really what makes the show racist. You could swap the design entirely for something less based on the racist caricature of black people, and the show would still be disgusting. Still, I think this is the best place to start. First, because even this obvious truth about terraformers has been lied about and ghastly out of existence, so it would make me personally feel good to set the record straight. But second, because the show's relationship with the Martian Roach people is vitally important to how it builds its ethno-nationalist propaganda, so this needs to be explored. So yeah, the anime's Martian Roach people are racist African caricatures. Christ, that's even a stupid sentence to type out, let alone say into a microphone. Ugh. Find a black person who has never seen the show, and show them the image I linked above. Ask them if they look like black people. 99 times out of 100, they'll say yes. The first most common defense of the show's and the manga's awful design decisions is that real cockroaches are also dark in color, so there's nothing wrong here. You're the real racist because you're comparing what are obviously cockroaches to black people unprompted. Checkmate, SJW! Is how the gaslighting portion of this argument usually goes. So, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm writing on the internet, this is YouTube, so I have the wonderful ability to just put up images for y'all to look at. Here's what an actual cockroach looks like. And now here's a black human being. And now here's a roach person from Terraformars. That was fun. Pretty colors. Shiny. Means I'll have to put in a modicum of effort editing the audio version now. Oh well. Let's try this one more time anyway. Cockroach. Now a black person. And Terraformars again. Okay, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone else. Tell me. Please. Do the Terraformars Martians look more like black people, or more like cockroaches? I'll give you a hint. One of these answers is wrong, and it's the second one. In the second picture from the anime, where you can barely see their antenna, 
There's nothing really there that's supposed to make us read these characters as cockroaches. If you notice the antenna, they could be any insect at best. We only know they're cockroaches because the show says so again and again. Yet, no matter what angle you look at them from, they always seem to share some of the more, let's say, culturally distinct features of blackness. Their mouth shape and lips, their nose shapes, the muscular bodies. I mean, if all black men had bodies like that, I'd have mad chicks to disappoint. Sadly for my love life, it's a stereotype that has no basis in reality, and only serves to make it seem as though black people, black men in particular, are made of more animalistic muscle than human intelligence. In America, it's a holdover from when we needed to justify black people doing all the manual labor in the country. Today, we don't need that justification anymore because we just put all the black men in prison to do that labor anyway. Progress! Okay, 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 okay. So, clearly, some of you are not on board. I've still got fucking ammo left, so let's keep going. Here's a humanoid bug from another medium, Pokemon Black and White, that retains far more insect qualities than Terraformars' cockroaches do without being racist. And here is a creature from Homestuck that's black and chitinous, like Terraformars' roaches are supposed to be, but also manages not to be ridiculously, obtusely, ludicrously, white friend's uncle on Thanksgivingly fucking racist. It's amazing how easy it is to never run into the exact problem Terraformars has. Who'd have thunked? People have argued that the Martian roaches are just similar to Homo erectus or some other pre-human stage of evolution, just recolored and textured to look like cockroaches. Any other resemblances to any race is a mixture of coincidence and projection. Whereas, this argument is literally nothing. Black people have been compared to the theoretical look of Homo erectus since forever. Eugenicists and race realists have asserted that black people are less evolved than their white counterparts closer to apes and Homo erectus than Homo sapiens for centuries. Saying, they're not black, they're less evolved subhumans, is not the defense some might think it is. As we've learned more about the various types of early humans, we've become prone to graft our racialized interpretations of people onto early humans. From the controversy, quote-unquote, surrounding the idea that the first humans to land on the British islands may have been dark-skinned, to the science news media running with the idea that Homo erectus was so lazy it drove itself extinct, despite the fact that that conclusion, A, wasn't found in the original scientific paper the headlines were based on, and B, represents the guesses of one of the researchers, while the other researchers stated their disagreements with the idea. Evolution, science, and Homo erectus have all been racialized since the dawn of time. You can't hide behind them in an attempt to deflect what Terraformars is clearly doing here. Second, that's my second point. Second, again, they don't look like cockroaches at all. You can call back to Homo erectus without doing that stereotype African look. It's, it's art. There's not one way of doing anything. Guys, for real, the bugs have afros. Like, seriously, they do. Just look with the eyes God gave you. Are you shitting me? <sighs> Bring me a cockroach that has my hair, and I swear to God, I will delete every treatise and hot take I've ever written. I'll retire forever. You'll never hear that some mediocre show is actually racist or capitalist propaganda ever again. Just show me one fucking bug that just so happens to have my skin, my face, and my hair, and I will shut this blog down right the fuck now. No, it's just not true. There's no argument here. Yet this is a narrative that won after five years of discourse. Fuck me. There is no reason at all why these designs would just so happen to turn out the way they have. In fact, adding more distinct features of cockroaches to the Martian roach people would improve the design and communicate more effectively the ideas the show is trying to convey. Imagine, for a minute, if these creatures had lighter front sides and underbellies, like cockroaches do in real life, dark bug eyes, pointed chins, reversed legs, alien feet, limbs with like hair on them, Maybe an abdomen. 
Would that not look scarier? Would that not scream cockroach? Instead of 50 scenes of the main characters calling them damn roaches and flashing images of cockroaches in front of my face whenever they move, you could just like show through the design that they're cockroaches. Would it not be more thematically resonant? This show chooses not to do this though. This is a common theme here on Most Home for Treatises and Hot Takes. People consuming media often get trapped in or choose to adopt the thinking that everything that's on the page or on the screen is just how it has to be. In reality, the only reason why anything in a story exists is because the author chooses to make it happen. It's not just people of color who view terraformers as Martians as stand-ins for Africans. There's another important group of people who see it the same way. Actual racists. When the manga first started to gain popularity, and especially after the anime was first released, corners of the internet far-right memed the show to all hell. It was just as fun as you'd imagine. Terra for Mars design has been controversial for being seen as a parody of African American people, although is based on Homo erectus. As a joke, the Terra for Mars are sometimes referred as African American people, often using stereotypes. That's from a that's from Know Your Meme. Anyway, ah uh, yes, here we see the return of the famous law of nature that states that things cannot both be jokes and racist at the same time. It's one or the other, man. You gotta choose. You gotta choose. One of the worst things the far right on the internet has done is convince minorities that we can't tell when we're being made fun of. Like the bully that harasses you every day in gym and then harasses you for getting upset at being harassed because those last times were just jokes, he swears! At the very least, racists think Terraformars is racist. That's like, not a good thing, last time I checked. Part 2, Stereotype Emporium, aka, yes, it does get worse. Alright, so maybe the bugs do look a little like black people, and maybe 4chan trolls did get a hold of it. So, what's the harm? After all, Terraformers has black humans as well, right? They look normal. Some of them even have speaking lines. So maybe we chalk this up to a bad choice in character design that ultimately never hurt anyone? No. I've still got ammo left. Way more, because of course I do. This is a treatise after all, that's why I'm here, to trigger the cons with facts and lodging. Because see, what really makes these creatures racist stereotypes isn't really the design. Like I said, the designs just got the most attention when the anime was first made. As usual, not really the worst part. Mars is the shit holiest country. The terraformers are scientifically undeveloped. I want to make it clear that this makes sense. In universe, the cockroaches have only been on the surface of Mars for the past 500 years or so, cut off from the technological developments of the planet Earth. That's not really enough time to develop a good understanding of physics, engineering, mathematics, medicine, and the like. Those things on Earth took thousands of years and thousands of cultures working together to understand. Again though, not really concerned with whether or not terraformage justifies its bigotry with internal logic. I'm interested in how the world is framed. A mysterious disease from a faraway place is threatening to end civilized life as we know it. The people who live in these places are hardly people at all. They are club-wielding, rock-throwing masses that brainlessly attack everything not like them. They rarely wear clothes or shoes. The narrative will constantly mention that individual members of this people are not capable of problem-solving. and must take direct orders from a leader that happens to be more intelligent than expected. The only artificial structures that these Martian Roach people seem to be able to build are pyramids, which just so happen to be the most iconic structures on the African continent. Can I just mention that this is the shittiest argument for the idea that Africans can't build things? White civilization today is still unsure how the pyramids were built given the tools available to the Egyptians at the time. The pyramids that find themselves in Africa and Latin America are literally unlike anything white civilization has ever accomplished. 
The discrepancy seems so hard to square that white people will literally believe in aliens before believing that the ancient Egyptians, Nubians, and Mexicans were maybe more advanced than they're given credit for. Anyway, one character says of the terraformars, Because of you and the rest of your kind, Earth is becoming a shit show. He continues, You feel nothing. No pain, no fear. That's why you'll never progress like us, you pieces of shit. Okay, so uh, these are all just various stereotypes people have about Africa. It's the shithole where all the diseases come from. Remember the conservative reactions to the HIV epidemic or the more recent Ebola epidemic? Its people are uncivilized, still uncomfortable wearing shoes. With the exception of ancient Egypt, Africans don't build things. They just live in the jungle or the desert, in mud huts or in the wilderness. Africans are either too stupid to progress like the rest of the world, or too uncultured, or both. It doesn't matter what the terraformers look like in this case, though it does make matters worse. You don't bring all these tropes together by accident, it's a deliberate and obvious attempt to make a statement on world affairs. Maybe this is more obvious to me than it is to mainstream anime fandom, because I've been exposed to this rhetoric and I've had it used against me. But this isn't really complicated stuff, you just put two and two together. There's a bad place filled with savages who are bringing diseases that will kill us all unless we do something about them. This something involves indiscriminate, ruthless, unrelenting violence until the threat is neutralized. Here be dog whistles, y'all. Black people are violent. Um, a content warning for this part, we're going to talk about female genital circumcision. While the anime starts with the story of the Annex 1 landing on Mars to collect enough roach samples to find a cure to the virus threatening humanity, the manga starts a few years earlier with the Bugs 2 mission. This is treated in a prequel anime that got made, but I never watch because I'm working on respecting myself for just at least a little bit. On the Bugs 2 mission, there was a South African woman named Victoria Wood. Her powers are based off the Emerald Cockroach Wasp, which is equipped with a stinger that disables the fight-or-flight response in cockroaches, turning them into what are essentially slaves. Victoria Wood does the same thing to the Martian cockroaches on a larger scale, injecting them with what is essentially a mind control poison. It's taking a real thing and exaggerating it to fit a horror sci-fi setting. Not too bad, I guess. And a brief pause in the action to the story, Victoria takes a moment to describe what life was like in her home country. Where I'm from, people bury the dead. When we buried my father, we encased him in concrete. That way, bandits couldn't steal his clothes. Sometimes they take the whole body. But after staying with a string of relatives, I survived by grave robbing too. She continues, remarking, the pain from the bugs procedure was nothing. Nothing compared to my FGM when I was 12. That hurts about as much as your Arakiri, I bet. Probably more since Japanese swords have such a sharp edge. Mine was done with the lid of a food can. I, I'm dying slowly, just so y'all know. I mean, I guess we're all dying slowly. Wait, would that mean I'm actually dying faster than average? Probably. I'm dying faster than is normal, but slower than I'd fucking like to. First of all, on grave robbing, that's not an African thing. It happens all over the world. Yes, even in Japan. Victoria explains this to a Japanese man as if it's some exotic and primitive thing that only savage Africans can imagine, but it's not. When people get poor and desperate, and when they know rich people get buried with expensive stuff when they die, it doesn't take much to put two and two together. Race has nothing to do with it. The issue isn't that no South African has ever robbed a grave, or that certain South Africans haven't thought to protect their dead from grave robbers before. It's framing grave robbing as this thing that happens in these shithole countries for black people. Nowhere on the African continent is grave robbing so bad that the poor encase their dead in concrete. People don't steal whole corpses either. I mean, holy fucking shit. How do you make money off a putrid, disintegrated body? Who's buying zombie flesh on the black market? What the actual fuck? 
Oh, no, 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 no. I see. It doesn't matter. You know, those Africans, they're not even civilized enough to have valid socioeconomic reasons for doing things. That's just how they work. And then there's this female general circumcision stuff. Look, if you wanted to stereotype Africans as these barbarians that mutilate little girls for fun, at least look up a fucking map of Africa and pick a country where this stuff happens to any sort of degree. The percentage of women in South Africa who undergo female genital circumcision is around the same as the percentage in the West who undergo it, which is to say the number is statistically insignificant. But I bet the person who wrote this only knows two African countries, Egypt and South Africa, and they picked the blacker one to make their point. That's probably how it worked. The author cited a fucking academic source when the narrator of the story went on a rant about how netting has evolved with human intelligence, yet doesn't bother to do basic research when it comes to African cultural practices. See, now, that's just the thing. Yes, it's true that the most severe forms of female genital circumcision are painful, irreversible, and often forced upon women. And yes, many people have built good reasons to oppose all circumcision on the basis of bodily autonomy and consent, but what this is not is an honest concern about ending sexist cultural practices in the third world. It's about using a real problem to insist that Africans are brutal, unthinking, violent savages. The author is just making up stuff about Africa that's sort of vaguely true if you stretch the truth enough because the point is not to actually care about women of the third world or victims of grave robbing. There are informed, empathetic, well-researched ways you could write a story about the challenges of growing up as a woman in a patriarchal third world country that actually move the conversation forward. We could talk about the various forms of the practice from least to most damaging and their effects. We could talk about the women who have chosen to undergo the procedure and what it means for their culture and their heritage. We can talk about Occidental religions and culture and what male genital circumcision means to the people who practice it. Maybe compare the two. Making up some bullshit about how South Africans saw 12-year-old clits off with rusty tin can lids because that's just how they are, lol, is none of that. It's disgusting. It's racism in its purest, most unadulterated form. The author doesn't even see Victoria Wood as a victim, just a byproduct of a failed, barbaric, violent Africa. Victoria dies unceremoniously and off-screen. Unlike her numerous white and light-skinned Japanese counterparts who died to inspire the men in the story to action, we never hear about Victoria again. The terraformers themselves are also shown to take a kind of glee in slaughtering as many people as they can. Again, not unilaterally a bad thing to have a kind of monster or villain that takes a joy in killing. It's a pretty common horror trope and can be effective. The issue is, as always, putting this trope into context. Black people and African people have been stereotyped as primitively violent for hundreds of years. Post-colonial Africa has reinforced the stereotype as the nation states there have struggled to define themselves in the power vacuum left by European colonial empires. Compare, for example, how the Holocaust is talked about to how something like the Rwandan genocide is talked about. There are scores of literature that explain in detail the various socioeconomic factors that led to the rise of anti-Semitism, hypernationalism, and the ultimate genocide of six million Jewish people off the face of the planet. Most average, red, non-Nazi people can either give a rough account of this history or, at the very least, acknowledge that the causes of this genocide were various and complex. The Rwandan genocide, though? Tribal conflict. One side just hated the other side. They couldn't get along, so they killed each other. So sad. People will explain away the current violence in Cameroon between the Anglophone minority and the Francophone majority as, it's just too bad they're a third world country. Colonialism, arbitrary borders, what are those? People will explain away the civil war in South Sudan and Somalia as, this is just how things are over there. People will explain away gun violence in Chicago as their culture loves violence, if they're even aware of this at all. In a study published in the Journal of Research in Crime and Delinquency entitled Mental Health, the Media, and Moral Politics of Mass Violence, the Role of Race in Mass Shooting Coverage, researchers at Ohio State University 
found that the media is 19 times more likely to present white mass shooters as mentally ill compared to black perpetrators. The media is also 12 times more likely to ascribe mental illness to Latino shooters than black shooters. As the authors state, Quantitative findings show that whites and Latinos are more likely to have their crime attributed to mental health than blacks. Qualitative findings show that the rhetoric within these discussions frame white men as sympathetic characters, while black and Latino men are treated as perpetually violent threats to the public. When white people are violent, there's always some rational explanation. No one just snaps, they say. There's always some sociopolitical context we're not factoring in. We have years of investigations into why ordinary people could end up enforcing the violence to the Nazi regime. We pour billions of dollars into researching how propaganda led to the rise of nationalism in Europe. We clamor for more mental health institutions whenever a sweet, innocent white boy decides to pick up a gun and slaughter his classmates. Black people are never afforded the same luxury. The media narrative is that black people are violent just because. Our suffering and our deaths need no explanation. There is no socio-political context for the Rwanda genocide, or the situation in Somalia, or the war in South Sudan, or gun violence in Chicago. Our deaths are the natural order of the universe. Our deaths are just how we are. The only difference between the liberal position and the conservative position is that white liberals pity us, while conservatives are disgusted. I'll paraphrase a message I got from someone online maybe a year or so ago. After Europe left Africa, everyone there kills each other. Blacks are always loud and violent when in large groups. Terraformars presents violence in exactly this attitude. We're shown clip after clip of these creatures that look like black men tearing people apart limb from limb, interspliced with images of disgusting bugs, while the characters go on and on about how horrifying and disgusting these people are. It's propaganda, pure and simple. Propaganda that would fit alongside depictions of the white man's burden. Black people are a threat to attractive, light-skinned women. Content warning for this little section here, we're gonna talk about rape. While both the manga and the anime are clear and unapologetic in their portrayal of the terraformers as violent, terrifying, unfeeling beings, it's especially effective in the anime. The show takes advantage of quick cuts and selective framing to make it as clear as possible how dangerous these beings are. But on top of the general framing of terraformers as violent killers, the show has a specific emphasis that this violence is directed towards attractive light-skinned women. The implications here are quite explicit. In fact, the anime tells you as much with this piece of dialogue here. The terraformers target enemies according to a specific hierarchy. First, they attack anyone with a tool or the tools themselves, especially if they're good ones. Second, they attack anyone alone. Third, they attack anyone injured. And fourth, for some reason, they love to go after women. We don't know why they go after women. It's not for sexual gratification, it's eerie. But there's definitely something that attracts them. In addition, at least one character states that the Martian Roach people, quote, are nothing but worthless swine, creatures who poison our daughters, unquote, and uses that as a stated reason for wanting them all dead. The stand-in for violent animalistic black mobs has been so dehumanized that we're told explicitly that they're incapable of a basic human feeling, sexual desire. This is of course not to imply that our asexual comrades aren't human. Rather, it's the story that frames a lack of sexual attraction as a lack of humanness and paints that characterization onto its African-slash-black standards. The show doesn't even do the weird, like, cross-species attraction trope thing. Africans are just so base, so vile, so unlike civilized people that we're incapable of even feeling sexual attraction as we go around raping, molesting, and killing for no good reason whatsoever. The term Black Pearl refers to an idea formalized in the context of colonial Africa, but present in any part of the world where a white ruling class governed over black people. Black Pearl was the idea that African men had an uncontrollable desire to copulate with white women. Black Pearl tends to specifically refer to colonial or apartheid South Africa and colonial South Rhodesia. However, 
This idea played out pretty much the same in the United States, without the label, from the Civil War onward. These governments would take accusations of rape and sexual assault by black men against white women as a pretext to restrict the rights of black men and perpetuate the idea, an idea that still exists today, mind you, that black men are inherently driven to assault fair-skinned women for some reason. The reality, of course, was far different. White men in these governments raped and killed black women with impunity while the police turned a blind eye. In the African colonies in particular, most of the white population were men, as the European governments at the time taught to send the male labor class to work and manage the colonies while the precious white woman stayed safe at home. These men re relieved their sexual frustrations with black women in encounters that were usually violent and certainly not consensual. Of course, white law enforcement officers themselves partook in these rapes, and they still do today. Currently in the United States, the police routinely abuse sex workers or just people they're stopping, and sometimes, if you're lucky, they'll actually charge one with a crime or something. Do we have data on this? Not really. Who the fuck are you gonna call when the police rape you? The police? Having an institution with a monopoly on violence that's only accountable to itself and capital is starting to sound like a bad idea. Hmm. Anyway, Black Pearl has historically been used as a pretext for violence against black men. Many of the lynchings committed in the southern United States by the Ku Klux Klan use alleged sexual violence by black men as an excuse. In South Africa, the fear that black men have uncontrollable sex drives led to a government campaign to control the black population in South Africa through immigration control and limits on the fertility of black women. In South Rhodesia, black men were forced into domestic servitude in white households. This paranoia that African men were sleeping with white wives while the husbands were at work led to support for increased laws that controlled the freedom of movement of African men, and laws that allowed the police to kill black men for whatever the police sought to define as, quote, attempted rape, unquote. In all three of these countries, black pearl was used to enforce bans on interracial sex, marriage, and children. Since at least 2011, all this crap is getting shoveled unceremoniously into the minds of clueless anime and manga fans. And in 2019, I get to write a fucking essay about it. I I love history, man. It rocks. If all that stuff about the clan and African history doesn't really move you, if you're still wondering what the hell is South Rhodesia is, it's modern day Zimbabwe. Here's the proof for why all this is important. Black Pearl might have been an idea that started with strong associations to Africans and blackness, but the idea that men of color are these rapist hordes coming to deflower our beautiful young fair-skinned maidens is an idea that has since been grafted onto the entirety of the global south. The very stable genius that is the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, routinely uses the association of men of color with rape to forward a rapidly xenophobic, classist, anti-immigrant agenda. Consider how Despite the fact that there is no evidence that a link between undocumented U.S. immigrants and crime exists, the 2018 murder of Iowa State University student Molly Tibbetts was used to rally conservatives into clamping down on immigration laws and rights for undocumented immigrants. Consider how this image alone, an attractive young white woman juxtaposed with a scary brown man, probably helped legitimize the perceived need for concentration camps for migrants at the U.S. border where immigration officials abuse, harass, and kill their occupants more than any trumped-up statistic or fact ever could. Black Pearl is not some obscure thing of the past. Black Pearl has just changed and evolved to serve the needs of the present ruling class. Terraformars is part of this transformation. The story is part of this colorful tradition of using the idea that men from the global south are driven by some inexplicable yearning to rape light skin women to implement policies that further suppress the people in the global north that have the fewest rights. The poor, the non-citizens, the minorities, and the refugees. It's not because the story was written in Japan by a Japanese person that these realities don't apply. The idea that only white people can be racist is not one I support, so don't parrot that racism is privilege plus power shit to my goddamn face, please. The idea that Japan, a country that was a fascist imperialist empire that took over Korea, most of China, Southeast Asia, and show no signs of stopping until the U.S. military indiscriminately killed millions of civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, a country which today still has high-profile citizens deny the war crimes committed by this fascist imperialist empire, a country in which 
97% of the population is ethnically homogenous, and that is about to receive an influx in immigrants to combat its dying labor force, cannot possibly have a problem with racism because they're not white is so insane and so ahistorical that I honestly do not have the time or patience to take it seriously. I'm not saying that all Japanese people are racist or whatever, and as someone who's never lived in Japan and doesn't even speak enough Japanese to hop on right-wing Japanese Twitter, I'm not qualified to say if Japan is a racist country or not. Calling a country racist isn't even a meaningful delegation. I'm only asking the world to stop using, but Japan though, to deflect criticism from this obviously awful, obviously racist story. Terraformars and Immigration So speaking of immigration, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> uh, this has to be my favorite transition yet. Anyway, Ben Shapiro. The ultra-conservative Orthodox Jewish political commentator came into prominence following a confluence of changes in the U.S. political landscape on and off the internet. From the rise in neoliberalism in the 1980s, to Ronald Reagan's redefinition of religious American conservatism, to the death of bipartisanship under Bill Clinton in the 90s, to 2010's reactionary racist Tea Party movement following the election of America's first black president, to the rise of internet conservative talk radio around 2011, which sent conservative Americans further to the right, to the cultural colonization of the internet by the alt-right in 2014, propelled largely by Gamergate, to the crystallization of right-wing American populism following the rise of Donald Trump. Each one of these cultural phenomena feeds into the fast-talking, Arab-hating, college campus debating, climate-denying, feminist-owning, trans women misgendering, 411 being cool kids philosopher we know and love today. <sighs> Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Karl Marx, the 18th Premier of Napoleon Bonaparte. In 2016, Ben Shapiro published a fiction novel entitled True Allegiance. As far as I can tell, it's a collection of his various conservative beliefs wrapped up in a novel of flat characters and nonsensical plot lines. I don't think I'll ever be covering it at length on most home for treatises and hot takes, in part because there's a limit to how much self-inflicted mental pain I can take, and in part because it's been done better already. Link in the description. The book takes place in a dystopic alternate version of the United States run by a socialist, red, center-left neoliberal, president. The country is overrun by illegal immigrants and drug cartels at the border, black crime, and waves of Muslim terrorists entering the country. All the while, the president cares more about sucking up to the media than doing what needs to be done to protect white Americans. The heroes of the story include oil tycoons who use their own money to run for office to combat EPA regulations, the U.S. military, the U.S. government, when it cracks down on poor people, terrorists, as long as they're white, and cops that shoot eight-year-old black kids. The story's villains include the liberal media, the U.S. government, when it hands out welfare, terrorists, as long as they're Muslim, and civil rights leaders who manipulate black people into getting mad when the cops shoot eight-year-old black kids. So anyway, Ben fucking Shapiro. Near the beginning of True Allegiance, we learn that parts of California and New Mexico have been given away to the Mexican government under the current administration to atone for America's imperialist past. We visit a city in what remains of California, which is particularly suffering due to the president's open borders policy. Ben writes, Sunny Pool, a si wait, should I do my Ben Shapiro impression? <clears throat> Sunny Pool, a city in Eastern California. Okay, folks, the city- no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Sunny Pool, a city in Eastern California, the city with the greatest economic disparity and the highest incidence of drug-related crime in the developed nations. The drug cartels of neighboring Mexico are mostly to blame. 69% of police officers die on the job. 4 of 10 females over the age of 13 have been raped and they pour into the country as if escaping hell, the illegal immigrants. So what's this have to do with terraformers? The answer is, I'm a liar. You see, that last bit I said about the president of True Legions giving away parts of the US to Mexico didn't happen in the book. The quote isn't from the book either. Those things happen in terraformers. 
I barely had to change the code to make it work, I just stripped away the little bit of world building the story has. This is how it actually reads in the manga. Sunny Pool, a city in Eastern California. The city with the greatest economic disparity and the highest incidence of drug-related crime in the developed nations of the 27th century. The drug cartels in neighboring Grand Mexico are mostly to blame. 69% of police officers die on the job. 4 of 10 females over the age of 13 have been raped, and they pour into the area as if escaping hell, the illegal immigrants. The story seems to be confused about what the US-Mexico border really looks like. It sort of implies that the highest, coldest parts of the Rocky Mountains lie between the US and Grand Mexico. I took that to mean that Grand Mexico has expanded in territory, but it could just be that the author is an idiot. It's probably the latter. Point is, the story's two Mexican main characters, Alex and Marcos, are treated with the tact of a fucking Ben Shapiro novel. The two are indistinguishable. Don't tell me I didn't fool you there for a second. If you'd read the book, you were probably confused as to why you didn't remember a quote that outrageous. A quote so obviously Shapiro-like. I think, despite it all, it's sometimes hard to imagine an anime or manga as right-wing propaganda. This is in part because we're trained to other foreign media, because these media are produced in a strange land by people who speak a language you don't understand and who don't look like us. The stories in this media are, are always abstract, enjoyable on some level, but ultimately incapable of speaking for anything past the material conditions in Japan. I'm reminded of when a friend told me about an Islamic civilizations class he was taking. He mentioned being frustrated because the other students in the class seemed incapable of analyzing Islamic political figures past the text of the Quran. Europe has had plenty of religious heads of state, yet we understand that their motivations are not tied to the Bible. They were human beings who wanted power, land, control, wealth, and more. Yet, because the Islamic world is seen as an other, as something different, as something unrelatable and irrelevant to the West, its leaders must be driven by something equally strange and unrelatable, like the Qur'an. It's the same dynamic here. Terraformars openly inserts itself into the ongoing conversation on American immigration policy and civil rights. If I sound like a broken record, it's because I can't stress this enough. The story is talking about us as much as it's talking about Japan. Terraformars likens the fall of U.S. global hegemony as a head that's been cut off. Once powerful and in control, it's now lobbed off and shriveled. This leaves the opportunity for newcomers to suck the blood. It's kind of confusing. Anyway, what cut off this head? Immigrants, of course, and China. We'll get to that later. These are literally talking points ripped out the Trump White House. The only difference here is the author seems to be pleased about it because the decline of the United States, unfortunate as it may be, will allow Japan to rise to its rightful place as a global superpower. This is as much forethought Terraformars puts into its 27th century geopolitics. The world is basically the same except we've engineered a situation in which Japan is the best country now. Oh, and I guess we recreate the geopolitical circumstances of World War II as well? More on that later. Also, I lied again! Ha! The world isn't the same. The world is worse. The story asserts that the future generations haven't been able to curb breeding in the global south. The world is now overpopulated and it's leading to the decline of what should otherwise be great nations like the United States of America. Overpopulation is the stated reason why Mars needs to be colonized. Including Captain Komachi and I, there are six officers from the UN member nation space agencies who risk their lives to undergo the surgery. In addition, there is currently a crew of 90, our reserves. Hey, how did you get 90 people? Wait, counting the failed surgeries, that would have been more... Who knows? It just... Feels like there's trafficking going on. Either way, these days, the one thing Earth has too much of is people. Remember that all the candidates to get the surgery needed to go to Mars are explicitly the dregs of society the poor, the criminals, and other minorities. This woman, her name's Michelle, and thus the story blatantly state that the best way to make these undesirables useful to society would be to kill them, experiment on them for the greater good, or give them the most dangerous jobs in society that we wouldn't want to waste on the desirable. Daily reminder that the US government conducted dangerous syphilis experiments on black men in the 30s, and the US's racial hierarchy directly inspired laws created in Nazi Germany. Genocide? I mean, 
Sure, the world is overpopulated anyway, right? Let's circle back to Marcos and Alex. These two characters lived in Grand Mexico with their parents. Their families were poor, as are the vast majority of Mexicans in this story, of course. The only reason why they would have decent lives at all is because their dads worked for a rich, white landlord. The daughter of these parasites, I mean, landlords, is Sheila, who befriends Marcos and Alex to protect them from the roving hordes of gangsters that regularly threaten their peaceful lives. Alex and Marcos, in turn, take a liking to Sheila. They admire her and want to protect her. They're not interested in her sexually, though. <laughs> oh, gross, could you imagine? An old black ram tupping a white ewe. Their lives go to hell when Sheila's parents refuse to pay their servants. The workers go on strike and eventually revolt, burning down Sheila's estate and leaving her as an orphan. Alex and Marcos live with the guilt that their dads killed their best friend's parents. <sighs> I shit you not, the story presents the rich white landlords as the good guys here. Marcos and Alex's parents are the greedy, ungrateful browns who didn't realize how good they had it since the white man started taking care of them. The anime goes as far as to call them greedy. To be clear, the anime removes the context from Marcos and Alex entirely. We don't know they're legal immigrants, and we're barely made to understand that the two boys' parents weren't getting paid at all. All the racist manga subtext is paved over for the anime. In the anime, they're just poor people who come from somewhere and know Sheila somehow. That's not better, to be clear. Not exactly, that's worse. The anime knew the subtext of the original and reinforced it, just choosing to cut around the parts most likely to generate controversy. That's not the same thing as rewriting it to not be problematic. Sheila, now an orphan, is able to emigrate to the U.S. using her family's wealth and connections. However, Marcos and Alex must arrive illegally. They note how there are no more jobs because other undocumented immigrants took them all. Job machine broke. Whack. There's a funny line where Alex is afraid someone will mistake him for an Indian. Because God is there nothing worse than being an Indian, I guess. The author is not just content with hating brown people in the far-off lands of Mexico and the southwest United States. He's perfectly capable of also hating brown people a little closer to home, like Indians. These, these could actually be Native Americans. I'm like, not sure, and unwilling to put in the effort to find out. These undocumented immigrants were a drain on the system when they were just trying to get jobs and make a decent living for themselves. The story respects them only after they're willing to risk their lives on human experimentation and a suicide war mission to Mars. After all, there are too many of their kind around anyway, right? The world is overpopulated. I quite liked you, Captain. Not to mention I still owe you a drink. But I won't let the 9 billion people of Earth end up like the 100 on the Annex. There are 7 billion people on the planet right now, and we currently make enough food to feed 10 billion. Terraformars' definition of overpopulated to the point that we should consider culling the Global South is 9 billion people 6 whole centuries into the future, where innovations have no doubt made food production far easier and more efficient than it already is. Yeah, so this story isn't concerned about overpopulation, if such a thing even exists. Keeping in line with the long tradition of eugenicists and capitalists who use overpopulation as a pretense for global population control and genocide, Terraformars is concerned with eliminating certain groups of people off the face of the planet. I'm running out of ways to say this story is racist and gross, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about something way more fun. Let's talk about boobs. This is section two. Part three, the not so obvious, AKA, does Chad shower? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So I need to talk to y'all about positivity cause this shit drives me up the wall. When I watch anime, I watch dubs by default. I, I, I promise this is going somewhere. I'm not gonna make this a whole tangent about subs versus dubs, but my preference for dubs basically comes down to the fact that Anime is an audiovisual experience created with the assumption that you can understand what the characters are saying through your ears while you watch. When a show is dubbed in a language you understand, 
That's closer to the original intended experience to spending 20 to 50% of your attention at the bottom of the screen reading. The thing about dubs, though, is that politically speaking, they are guaranteed to be the most filtered form of the story you're consuming. When a manga or light novel gets made into an anime, some of the, let's say, rougher edges are cut down to appeal to a wider Japanese audience and make that money off the backs of underpaid animation staff. But then, when the anime is dubbed and brought into the West, more edges are cut to make even more money off the backs of underpaid voice acting staff. Somehow the end result is still fucking awful. So if you're me, you're watching the dub, disgusted by how gross a particular anime might be, it literally can only get worse. There's nowhere to go but down. You dig into the source material and things just get worse and worse and worse. So, positivity. Who is she? And why do we care? There's a woman on the Annex 1 named Ava Frost. She serves under the German squadron. She's a very annoying character. She's scared the entire time. She pisses her pants at one point. She whines some more and then she dies. This is what her character bio looks like in the manga. Alex says of her in episode 1, What's this chick's deal? She's got nice tits, but she's super negative. To which Marcos responds, Yeah, Miss Negativity. Negativity. Nice one, Marcos. Stellar wit. Thanks for your input. In episode 2, we meet another woman, Elena Perepalinka. She's also annoying. We meet her in the shower with her boobs swapping around everywhere because she forgot to lock the door of the shower. She kind of stares at Ava and Sheila for an uncomfortable few seconds before saying, unprompted, Tell him how you feel. Women are meant to fall in love. Whatever may come. Older men? That's not really my thing, though. <laughs> okay, she didn't really laugh like that, but still. Elena later dies a horrible death. So did Sheila Ashley and a bunch of other female characters, just mercilessly slaughtered by those evil Africans and always to give some Japanese or white man somewhere a reason to carry on fighting the good fight. Huh. Weird. Hopefully, this idea that the purpose of woman is to fall in love with a man is sexist is obvious enough. Women aren't meant for anything related to men, they just kind of are. Packaging that idea inside a sexualized, hyper-feminine mouthpiece is also awful, because the show is asserting that this is what a real woman looks like, with real woman thoughts, who understands the plight of her less experienced and less endowed acquaintances. I'm really more interested in Ava's response, however. I guess she's Miss Positivity or something. We have entered the anarcho feminist Hegelian dialectic phase of huge anime rack discourse. Positivity and negativity clearly represent the duality of man, but if we dig deeper, we'll see that the two also illuminate the permanent bifurcation of womanhood that took place after the advent of the sexual revolution, and the ramifications of the consequences of the rapid spread of awareness of international patriarchal oppression across class lines. I'm fucking with you, of course. It, it means nothing, as usual. This, this is my hobby. This is what I've reduced myself to. The gags are supposed to be funny, I guess, but it's only funny in that it's awful in every way. I was a little too curious to take such a bizarre running plotline on face value, so I compared these scenes with their sub-counterparts. In the Japanese dub, Alex isn't complimenting Ava's tits even. The conversation instead goes like this. Not only does she look unfortunate, but she's super negative. Yeah. She's negative boobies. Likewise, Elena is positive boobs. It's a direct translation of Japanese. I noticed because the Japanese is formed from the English loan word for negative and then opai. Sometimes it's really not that hard. 
Someone decided that it would be in the show's best interest to swap Alex's naked disdain for Ava's looks with him creepily talking about her body out of earshot. And I guess Marcos makes a pun too? You know, some executive somewhere was convinced this was the route to making as much money with this property as possible. Remember, capitalism and competition always lead to innovation, especially in the arts. People read the words positivity and negativity and fucking thought this was acceptable writing, like they gave it to voice actors who had no choice but to birth it into reality to keep a roof up over their heads. Positivity and negativity have existed and will always have existed. This was someone's eternal contribution to the human experiment. <laughs> but I guess even more bizarre. Oh, you thought I was done? <laughs> if you did, you must be new here. Man, that girl is all doom and gloom, huh? Ah, it's negative tits. NTT for short. Oh yeah? In the manga, Alex doesn't even make a comment about her body at all. He just says she's negative and Marcos makes a crude one-off joke. Oh yeah. One-off joke, as in, positive boobs is not a thing. The entire shower scene where Elena forgets to lock the shower door and we see her boobs falling out of her costume does not exist in the manga. In the manga, Elena is introduced in the same sequence she dies. In the anime, they bump up her introduction earlier to the shower scene. And her boobs aren't even that big in the manga? They upped her cup size for the anime by like a factor of maybe two or something. I I don't know. I don't I don't wear bras. I'm eyeballing it here. So now think about the entire evolution of positivity from the source material to the dub. In the Terraformers manga, the author writes in some random Russian Soviet. I don't really know. The story kind of uses the two words interchangeably for some reason. So there's this Russian Soviet woman who exist to die for shock value. There's also an exchange near the beginning of the story where two characters calls a different girl negative boobs because she's negative. These two characters are not related. They never speak to each other. The people making the Japanese version of the anime realize intrinsically that there are probably too many no personality female characters that get dismembered brutally for no reason, other than that the original author views female life itself as disposable or only useful for making men take action on things. Someone on the Japanese writing staff, presumably after snorting a fat line of cocaine and slamming his head face first against his desk, thought the way to fix this would be to relate the random Soviet character with negative boobs. Presumably this comparison works because they both have boobs. They, they both get double the titty mass just to hone in these character similarities. This is what us in the business call organic character interaction. But when they rework the manga into the anime, they just call one of the girls ugly. This doesn't come back or lead to anything. They just do it because why not, right? And then the Western dub makers come along. The writer's room is looking at the script for the Japanese dub. One writer says, This line might be a little problematic for Western audiences. Any ideas on how to change it? And then some other guy shouts, NEGATIVITY! And everyone claps, and he gets a huge raise, and they graft that onto positive boobs too, because they have to for the aforementioned organic character interaction. Anime fans watch this show. Female fans see it and they're like, hey, this is kind of sexist, you know? The weaves stand up in retaliation, united against the scourge of SJWs infecting their safe spaces with politics. Keep them in Nazism out of anime. Stop being so sensitive. This is normal storytelling. The story of positivity is probably the most clear example of just everything wrong with the way the industry treats female characters. There is a systemic problem of underwriting female characters. Too many manga and light novels just get published with flat, uninteresting female characters that get used as plot devices. Combined with the capitalist pressures to extract value out of female sexuality, and a lack of female representation on the creator and consumer sides of the fandom, anime ends up being this unholy mess of degrading imagery, undeveloped female characters, and unrealistic body proportions. If, if you're wondering why you can't watch Fire Force without some awful etchy scene showing up every three seconds, or why your favorite female characters from this or that shonen don't get developed, or why scenes that are basically men groping women without their consent keep getting put into otherwise normal shows, this is why. This is the thing right here. Instead of rejecting 
stories with this kind of inherent misogyny, the industry signal boosts them. Instead of fundamentally changing the kinds of stories that could be told, the industry gives us half solutions and quick fixes to sweep these attitudes under the rug. These practices make everything awful, and they're not accidental. The anime fandom has been cultivated by ultra-rich capitalists to be receptive to this kind of stuff. Anime has perfected the art of turning sexism into profit. This is where I link the last episode of this series. I wish I could say that this was only the case in shows more seasoned anime fans consume. I wish I could say that the more forward-facing, western-friendly anime were better, but that's simply not true. My Hero Academia stumbled into a minor, I repeat, very minor, don't let the anti-SJWs blow this into a bigger deal than it was, Twitter controversy recently over how it translated some of the characters for the show's upcoming season from paper to animation. The studio that produces My Hero Academia, Studio Bones, is extremely good at replicating the art style of the manga they adopt into anime. However, somehow, when it comes to female characters and only female characters, the girls that fall outside the four corners of a very narrow, very specific, very profitable beauty standard get tweaked. Always tweaked in the exact same kind of way. Keep in mind Kohei Horikoshi isn't trying to make some feminist statement with his female character designs. He just finds the girls more attractive if they quote have a little meat on them unquote. Horikoshi just wants to see thick bods and skimpy suits. The industry won't even let that stand, let alone honest artwork that treats female sexuality with dignity. I hope it's becoming clear why there's no time like right now to talk about Terraformers, because while Terraformers might have spent its 15 minutes in the anime sun years ago, and while its mouse scores may be lacking, the fundamental institutional problems that let this show exist in the first place and let it make as much money as it did still exist. They still plague our media right now. In addition to the positivity debacle, which <laughs> I will continue to reference in my private life for the rest of time, Terraformers goes out of its way to make sure we know where it stands on the question of if women deserve equal rights or nah. There's a false rape accusation that makes an underdog male character hate society and commit acts of violence with impunity. I'm not going to spend very much time on this. If I think there's some sort of rule that every dumb fuck reactionary anime has a false rape accusation somewhere in its lore. I'm just gonna drop a source in the description that says false rape accusations are exceedingly rare. Boop. I'll add in a canned common sense statement right here. Just because some rape accusations are false, that doesn't mean you can't take any seriously when they come up, and that doesn't mean that you can use that as a justification to hate half the population, you inbred morons. And we'll move on. Sometimes, the more you argue about shit everyone should know, the more you make it look like there's something to debate. That there isn't. So, around the beginning of the story, after the crew of the Annex 1 lands on Mars, the Japanese-American squadron lands near a body of water created from the subsurface ice that's been melting on Mars for the past 500 years. Michelle Davis, the American squad leader, drops this line en passant. Shall I check if it's safe outside? Sure. We have 40 days worth of drinking water here, but hey, the more the merrier. We do have ladies on our team after all. As a non-lady, I admit the first time I heard this line in watching the anime, I let it slide. There are plenty of aspects of the female experience that are probably not intuitive to men, and vice versa. Wasn't the most important line, and I was busy processing positivity anyway, so I didn't think about it much. But after I read the manga, I started to ask questions, like, why exactly are women needing more water than men? Don't get me wrong, I've had the talk, I went through sex ed. Still, I was curious enough to learn more. I'm willing to accept that there may be obvious stuff I don't understand. I opened up a trusty incognito cab on Google Chrome and Googled, Women need more water than men. One study published in 2005 by the Institute of Medicine and the National Academic Press entitled, Dietary Reference Intakes for Water, Potassium, Sodium, Chloride, and Sulfate, link in the description, states that, on average, Men over the age of 19 consume 3.7 liters of water per day, 
compared to 2.7 liters of water per day of non-pregnant, non-lactating women. The only group of women in this study found that consumed more water per day on average were lactating women at 3.8 liters of water per day. As a reminder, n none of the principal characters in terraformars are lactating. Even then, these values aren't recommendations for how much water men and women should be drinking. Rather, as the report states, this is one volume in a series of reports that presents dietary reference values for the intake of nutrients by Americans and Canadians. The development of DRIs, daily recommended intake measurements, expands and replaces the series of reports called Recommended Dietary Allowances, RDAs, published in the United States, and Recommended Nutrient Intakes in Canada. Think of these numbers as more of a sophisticated average that found that cis men in the United States and Canada drink more water than non-lactating cis women. It's not saying, drink this much water or you're unhealthy. In fact, it admits that there are challenges to establishing such a thing. Given the extreme variability in water needs that are not solely based in differences in metabolism, but also on environmental conditions and activity, there is not a single level of water intake that would ensure adequate hydration and optimal health for half of all apparently healthy persons in all environmental conditions. The paper set out to determine four types of values to help doctors in helping their patients improve their diets. The type of value related to water intake is called an adequate intake, AI level, which is described as follows. The recommended average daily intake level based on observed or experimentally determined approximations or estimates of nutrient intake by a group or groups of apparently healthy people that are assumed to be adequate. On the AI of water specifically, the report states, Although a low intake of total water has been associated with some chronic diseases, this evidence is insufficient to establish water intake recommendations as a means of reducing the risk of chronic diseases. Instead, an AI for total water is set to prevent deleterious, primarily acute effects of dehydration, which include metabolic and functional abnormalities. The paper continues. As with the AIs for other nutrients, for a healthy person, daily consumption below the AI may not confer additional risk because wide ranges of intakes are compatible with normal hydration. In this setting, the AI should not be interpreted as a specific requirement. And, just in case that wasn't clear enough, a footnote states that, the AI's use of sufficient scientific evidence is not available to derive an estimated average requirement. The AI is not equivalent to a recommended dietary allowance. So dubious evidence at best that there's such a thing as one sex needing more water than the other, or even the idea that there's a set amount of water that any human needs. And if there were such a distinction, biological men would seem to need more water, not biological women. There are average amounts of water that people seem to be able to drink and not get dehydrated, and as long as you feel fine, there's really no need to stress over your water intake. I'm not a doctor by any means. If you're worried about your health, please see a licensed practitioner. However, the scientific evidence does suggest that if most people drank when they're thirsty, they'd be fine. At this point, I was very confused. Bad science? In my anime heavens, no. That's unheard of. Literally impossible. I have lost my ability to can. Chief drunk texted me to politely let me know that this really ain't it. Chief threw up later, but he's fine now. So I talked to some friends, one female and the other not. They both more or less told me that they have no idea what womanly thing women could be doing to femininely consume more water than everyone else. Terraformars desperately wants to be a scientific story. It's constantly quoting scientific papers and books out of context and mangling with scientific facts found on Wikipedia to give the narrative a superficial sense of authenticity. If I read out a scientific paper for everything this story got wrong, we'd be here all day. I decided to drop it. This little bit was actually not supposed to make it into the essay. The author has some unspecific misconception about biological sex, metabolism, and water intake. So what? It's no worse than the other time 
the author used mating behavior in some bird species to try and explain female infidelity in humans. That's a real thing I had to read. But then I came across this line, and I realized something. Also, we still have quite a bit of water left over, so any of you ladies who want to wash should come with me. Yay! Despite how much I loathe this story, I was still giving it too much credit. It's not that the author has a misunderstanding about biological sex and metabolism. It's not that he misstated some obscure scientific fact. It's that he literally believes that bathing is for a fucking woman. Holy shit! I'm going to lose my mind. Sometimes it really is that simple. <clears throat> Alright boys, time to eat. Don't mind the showers. Once a week should be good enough. Once a week should be good enough. Once a week should be good enough. Don't mind the showers. Once a week, once a week. Once a week should be good enough. Keep in mind, these characters are fighting for their lives every day. They are undergoing immense physical strain. They're living on a planet with limited plumbing. They're covered in sweat, dirt, and blood all day. If this author says once a week is good enough for men, that's a shower a week at most when things get tough. That's a shower a week maximum! MAXIMUM! Day to day, we're talking even less from this guy. I, I, I just... <sighs> so, I checked. Up until this point in the story, one. One male character takes a shower. And it's a scene that was cut from the anime and replaced with fucking positivity. Hey, Elena. Yes? Did you pee in the shower? Of course not. Look! I am trying. I am trying. Very hard. I am trying to understand the mindset you need to be in to unironically believe Chad doesn't shower. I can't do it. It's breaking my brain. It could be said that it's convenient that only women have to take showers, as then we only ever have to see the girls get naked and objectified, but the thing is, the shower fan service is entirely a product of the anime. The source material is weirdly titty-free. So, to summarize, in case you're having as hard a time keeping this all straight as I am, there's this racist prick somewhere alone in his basement who hasn't showered in a month because personal hygiene is pussy shit. He hates women, and he's just pushing this abject garbage into the world, rubber stamped by manga publishers. Otaku in the US and Japan are reading this and going, This is great! No problems here! Make this into an anime, please! And then some anime executive took a look at the story and was like, it's not bad. The only problem here is that there aren't enough naked anime boobs. There we go. Now it's perfect. I I think I need to go scream into a pillow now. See you for the next part, okay? Part 4, Colonialism, aka Exterminate the Black Organism. The Bullshit Asymmetry Principle, introduced by Italian programmer Alberto Brandoloni, states the following. The amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. It's a law applicable to most situations, and generally, if you want to be smug about something, you can pull this one out of your back pocket. However, when it comes to media criticism, there's kind of a bit of truth to the idea. Storytelling is a more powerful and efficient way of getting ideas across than theory is. This isn't to say theory, philosophy, facts, and yes, logic too, aren't important. We need people knowledgeable on the data to implement policies that will help people in the long term. But if your goal is a moral argument, to convert people to your principles, and sense of right and wrong rather than simply relay facts and figures, a story will always convey that kind of information better. 
It's an idea I explored in a hot take I did a while back about Dexter's laboratory. It's also why the left needs to stop trying to recruit people with Read Marx! Read Bread Book! This comes with a downside. If a story or joke conveys bad ideas, bad morality, and bad principles, a lot of people are going to absorb these principles without even realizing that that's what's happening. Stories can certainly fight bad principles, but a direct refutation of propaganda requires it to be addressed directly and stated more plainly, lest that story also be recuperated by the oppressive ideas it's trying to fight. And therein lies the fundamental imbalance in essays like this one. Through visuals, framing, dialogue, and plot, terraformers can argue that black people are genetically inferior to others, that women need to keep themselves clean more than men, or that immigrants are ruining civilization, all in what amounts to a little more than 26 standard length anime episodes. That's nine hours of content, three to five full length movies. The Star Wars films take longer to watch. If that sounds like a lot to you, try to imagine how long it would take to get this information by reading theory. You start by reading Nietzsche, chiefly Thus Spoke Zarathustra, then you'd move on to Charles Darwin's The Origin of the Species. Next you'd read Francis Galton and his fundamental text on eugenics, inquiries into the human faculty and its development. You didn't have to read some Alfred Breumer and Alfred Rosenberg, throw in some Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan just to get a good treatment on the benefits of authoritarianism. And who could forget Julius Evola, the premier thinker of fascism and traditionalism? And that's just the start. Note, because um, I know I'm going to get a little bit of hate for this, not all of these philosophers were fascists in and of themselves, and not all of these texts are inherently fascist. But all of these texts form the basis of fascist thought in the West. If you pick up any of these authors for any reason, please be careful. Also, the next bitch who quotes Darwin gets the guillotine. This silly anime about cockroaches on Mars and boobs synthesizes all of that into a 9 hour study session where it doesn't even feel like you're learning half the time. Maybe you lack the facts and the philosophy of reading fascist theory, but you have the ideas. And if you're unlucky, you believe them. Nowhere is this dynamic clearer than looking at how Terraformars treats colonialism. The answer lies within the very premise of the show. We're presented with a scenario where a pristine, empty land is ripe for the taking. The only problem? Hordes of lesser beings already live there, and they need to be exterminated to make room for the new, civilized population. I use the word exterminate here quite literally on the Bugs 2 mission. Before most people realize that the cockroaches have evolved, the text says literally that they land on Mars to spray a planetary-scale pesticide to make room for the human race. The mission doesn't change once it's confirmed that these beings do indeed possess human-like qualities. I'd actually argue that the stronger and more capable we learn the cockroaches are, the more that justifies ever-increasing violent action against them. And now here's the part where we realize that, historically speaking, this cavalier attitude towards the extermination of a people for the expansion of civilization and the exploitation of land and natural resources isn't new. The United States is a settler colonialist state. Here are what some of its founders thought of the native populations their country would eventually replace. If it be the design of providence to extirpate these savages in order to make room for the cultivators of the earth, it seems not improbable that rum may be the appointed means. Or how about... The immediate objectives are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops in the ground and prevent their planting more. And one more. Comedy tends to come in threes, after all. This unfortunate race, whom we had been talking so much pains to save and to civilize, have by their unexpected desertion and ferocious barbarities justified extermination, and now await our decision on their fate. It's not particularly relevant that the author probably didn't know enough about U.S. history to make specific reference to these specific figures. 
The important thing is the attitude is the same. No matter the culture, no matter the time, when you see your group as civilized and foreigners as not, when you see land as a resource to exploit and deplete, when your concern about uncivilized peoples is so low that you feel nothing at the idea of killing them all, you converge on the same intent. Terraformers doesn't need to specifically be aware of America's history of colonial attitudes to forward those attitudes itself. The colonialist attitude is simply much more global than any one country. Part 5. Nationalism, aka Friends Only Exist in Japan. Terraformers has some oddly specific hang-ups when it comes to what different people from different cultures can and can't understand. The funniest and clearest example of this is this bit here when the manga asserts that Americans don't have the concept of childhood friends. To be perfectly clear, the quality of the translation can often work to make something look more or less stupid. The very concept of childhood friends is not uniquely Japanese though. I'll give you that in Japanese culture. Osana no Jimi might have tropes, interpretations, and significations that are specific to Japan. But that's a different take entirely than only in Japan does this very rare and specific phenomenon of kids growing up as friends and staying that way happen. That kind of thinking requires, you know, nuance or something. I bring this up not to be pedantic and nitpicky, though those things are mighty fun but because it's emblematic of a larger trend in the series. Terraformers makes a clear effort to highlight the competitive nature of individual nation-states in geopolitics. This isn't inaccurate or anything, but the text doesn't seem to realize that this is a bad thing. In fact, it takes this nature of politics as a given, instead advocating for its own side, Japan first and foremost, to win at the expense of others. We return now to Victoria Tin Can Wood, because, you know, of course we do. In this chapter, Japanese crew member of the Bugs 2 mission, Ichiro Hiruma, hand rings about how, because Japan doesn't have nuclear weapons, it gets pushed around by larger powers. If only Japan had a strong, powerful military with which it could assert its interests. To which Victoria responds, in at least one translation, hmm. Japan's going through a lot for the prosperity of its people. The nationalist tendencies of the text are more subtle, baked into the background of the show's assumptions rather than some of the more overt forces we've been seeing in the story thus far. The nationalist undertones of the series are better understood when we zoom out for a bit and talk about the broader ideology of the series. Part 6. Selective, Selective reading, reading, aka Fascism IRL. This is a long essay. Longer than normal, even for me. There are a lot of moving parts that are important to consider if we're looking at terraformars as any kind of whole. This is in part because, unlike with a lot of other problematic anime, terraformars was written with a highly developed sense of ideological purpose. Any one sexist can throw a rape accusation into their story. Hell, a ton of authors who are otherwise not sexist will still end up writing their female leads into the same three kinds of roles and ogle at their bodies with the camera. A lot of well-intentioned centrists and liberals who just don't know two things about Africa will default to the same tired stereotypes and cliches about Africans. And character designs can always take on a racist or insensitive tinge if an artist isn't careful enough. The fact that regressive propaganda can be made by accident doesn't change the fact that these kinds of media are still regressive propaganda. However, it does differentiate itself from propaganda that is made for that purpose. Any one of these things I've talked about so far could in and of themselves be their own treatises. The fact that we've got all of this crammed into one story means that there's something else going on here. This isn't just subconscious anti-black bias leaking into the character design and world building. This isn't just thinking men don't shower. Terraformars is instead well aware of its own ideas and funnels almost all of its storytelling and world building efforts into selling you those ideas. Yeah, that's right. Terraformars brought politics into my anime. 
There is a missing ideological piece that collapses each of these ideas into a single superheated nucleus of utter bullshit, and it can be found in one character, Joseph Gustav Newton. On the Annex One, Joe was the leader of the European African Division. The story, as it pretty much always does if I'm being honest, tells us what we need to know about him. In this case, one character has a flashback to a time when another character was dryly rattling off a whole character bio for some reason. It's really stellar writing. Oi. Joe? Oh. Yeah, Joe. The track and field star. I first saw him on TV. In his junior year of high school, at the age of 17, he won the gold medal in the World Decathlon. People called him the King of Athletes. But that's not the whole story. After graduating, he quit track and field. He studied for exams, got high marks, and earned a spot in the EU's top university. He then attended an elite Air Force Academy and graduated at the top of his class, earning him an Air Force officer's rank and master's degrees in biology and aeronautics. His success is a testament to his intellect and grit, but he got a lot of help from people in high places. So, Joe's an Ivy League bourgeois brat, or what Republicans call lifting yourself up from your bootstraps. Okay, sure, whatever. Continue. Of course, it also doesn't hurt that he comes from a noble family. I'm sorry, a what? I've heard rumors that his family has, in a way, engineered itself to perfection. Supposedly, for centuries, members have picked spouses not for their wealth, connections, race, or nationality. They've based their selection on three factors alone. Looks, talent, and resistance to disease. In other words, his family has engaged in selective breeding. Oh my god. For starters, they're working with the mightiest predator in the animal kingdom. Humans. With the endurance and lung capacity to run 42 kilometers an hour at full speed. The throwing power that drove the mammoth to extinction. The intelligence of a person with an IQ of 186. An accelerated metabolism capable of immediate digestion and absorption of nutrients. The ability to create any kind of military weapon and use it like a master. Please. Please stop. I, I'm begging. We can have a nice, civil conversation. Just- It's taken 600 years. Behold the pinnacle of humanity. A human being created in the perfect image of God. The mosaic organ procedure for military combatants depends on the individual's innate strength and abilities. So there was never any doubt. We knew he'd be the strongest. Mars ranking one. Humanity in its ultimate form. Joseph G. Newton. Fuck it. We've gone full mask off then. This is just fascist propaganda. That's the missing piece. The story is just fascism with extra steps. I want to remind you that this anime fucking censored characters being undocumented immigrants and made sure to add in naked anime tits, but it didn't censor like, you know, selective breeding. I do not know where the fuck to start with this train wreck of a passage. Maybe I could start with the fact that things like talent are usually not hereditary, but a result of years of practice and study. What people often refer to as intelligence, scientists and sociologists are now beginning to consider a combination of different skills that can't accurately be measured by something like an IQ test. If nothing else, the strongest indicator for IQ is parental income. 
So things like hereditary intelligence are far more likely to be the byproducts of wealth hoarding. I could point out that we can't breed perfection into people if there even is one standard of perfection people can hope to attain. I could ask why the fuck perfection and in God's image seem to mean blonde-haired and blue-eyed. I could point out that the history of thinkers asserting that the Abrahamic God, Jesus, whatever, was an Aryan is intertwined with the development of fascist thought. Seriously, the history of positive Christianity in Nazi Germany basically redefined the story of Jesus of Nazareth as one where Jesus was an Aryan man who was betrayed and killed by the Jews. Positive Christianity was the Nazi party's attempt to incorporate Germany's white Christian majority into the fold of the Nazi regime before de-Christianizing the country as a whole. The whole, every soul is equal in the eyes of God and the meek shall inherit the earth and love thy neighbor stuff apparently just doesn't jive well with an ideology based entirely around exclusion and hierarchy. You can't tell me that because the author is Japanese, there can't be a connection here. The dude makes a literal fucking cross with his body as the music swells to a climax. If this was any more blatant, we'd be reviewing a Zack Snyder movie. I could talk about all of that. But I think there's one important observation we need to make about the idea of Joseph Gustav Newton. I think it's kind of interesting that we're told outright that the Newton noble family isn't racist. By that I mean it's specified that their selective breeding does not care about race or ethnicity. They pick the objectively best mates on the planet for hundreds of years and this is the result. You know I've actually unironically seen this as a defense for the show. Like, it doesn't mean anything that humanity in its ultimate form just so happens to be a blonde Aryan. That's just, that's just how it turned out. It's just, you can't blame me. You can't. I'm going to jump off a fucking cliff. No, 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 no. Nope, nah, nada, no. What the story actually asserts is the opposite. That if we objectively rated the genetic quality of the entire planet and picked the best traits, the best looking people, the smartest people, the strongest people, the fastest people, the people best suited for combat, and we bred those genes into people for generations on end, the only group of people who would have a significant role to play, the group of people this process would produce, would be Aryans. I'm sitting here. It's 1 a.m. on a Saturday morning. No one invites me out to things. Trying to explain in words how this is racist to the void of the internet. And I cannot. It's like proving the sky is blue. I also don't want to gloss over the fact that Joe's a man, not just a man, but a cisgendered heterosexual man. It's, it's codifying one of the most dangerous ideas in the fascist ideological toolbox. The Nazi interpretation of Nietzsche's Übermensch, the overman. Nietzsche's original idea was still masculine. He considered it woman's job to rear the overman into the world. Instead, it's it's somewhere in Thus Spoke's Arthur. Just go fucking read it somewhere. I'm not going to link a story. Somewhere. But the Nazis took that and asserted that their race was the only race capable of producing the overman. And that they actively needed to do so by controlling who got to breed in their country and who didn't. Terraformars took the idea central to Nazi philosophy, an idea that led to the most devastating war in human history. Six million Jews dead, millions of German ethnic minorities dead, millions of LGBT people dead, millions of disabled people experimented on or killed, and just propped it up on full display for the world to see. Like an old man flashing his wrinkly dick to four-year-old girls at the park at noon, Terraformars is shameless, obvious, and disgusting. And somehow, despite all of this, I'm like one of five people that's written about this in any way. People watched this, or read this, and they didn't see anything wrong. Not only that, but then they went on to badger all the hypersensitive SJW snowflake cultural Marxists for being too sensitive and whining and making everything political when there's a story peddling Nazi talking points out in the open. When I was 15, I was on the wrong side of Gamergate. I fully bought into the narrative that Anita Sarkeesian was an unhinged, man-hating, radical Stalinist feminist who was just looking for a reason to cry racist or sexist for money. 
I was fully steeped in anti-PC, anti-SJW culture. I was on R Tumblr in action all the time, a Reddit forum supposedly there to mock crazy Tumblr feminists, other kin, and beauty any size advocates. I listened regularly to YouTube personalities such as Teal Deer, Sargon of Akkad, and other such content creators. And you know what I distinctly remember from that awful, awful time? Whenever these people attacked a feminist for going crazy or some race baiter for making something about race when it wasn't, there was always this veneer of responsibility and civility. When I see real racism, of course I'll call it out. When I see real sexism, I'll call it out. When I see real homophobia, of course I'll call it out. Of course, of course. But this specifically, this is just bullshit. Guess what never actually happened for the years I spent in those online circles? Yeah, that. I eventually figured out something that to this day I wish I knew sooner. These professional nitpickers who obsess over liberal and leftist journalists, content creators and bloggers, harassing them, taking them out of context, engaging in bad faith arguments, and, in general, doing everything they can to discredit them or get them to stop making content, these people are racist. These people are bigots. There's nothing they will not defend. The same logic that they use to attack 16-year-old Tumblr progressives who haven't studied enough to have good takes all the time is the logic they'll use to attack anyone else that's actually trying to dismantle actual bigots, actual neo-Nazis, actual racist policies, and actual hate. Rather than being the pinnacle of human evolution, Joseph G. Newton is instead the pinnacle of all the toxic ideas the anti-PC crowd is willing to defend. They are fascists. This is what they want. And the more people they have who don't know better, who reflexively parrot the same three anti-SJW talking points whenever somebody tries to point out how problematic media can be, the larger their numbers. I've unfortunately taken my analysis of the series from a Eurocentric lens. The truth is, I just don't know enough about Japan. Books on Japanese nationalism and English are actually sort of hard to find. I got this one book on my Kindle, but like, I think it's broken. Thus, a full breakdown of the nationalistic tendencies in Japan, how they interact with neo-Nazi movements in the West, how Terraformars fits into the larger Japanese conversation of inclusion and race is sadly just not something I'm capable of doing. I can say that the story has of course adapted many of the same ideas fascism has in the West, from white supremacist patriarchy to colonialism. I can say that the story tends to frame the Chinese, both the people and the country itself, as a geopolitical scapegoat. I can say, given that the Japanese today see China as the biggest current geopolitical threat to world peace, source in the description, and given the numerous war crimes that Imperial Japan has committed in China that many would argue still have not been properly repaid or acknowledged, that the constant need for the story to have China and Chinese characters betray all of humanity probably definitely plays into the story's fascist narrative somewhat. I can say that in choosing the five global superpowers of the 27th century to be the Roman Federation, Italy, Russia slash the Soviet Union, again, Sina translated as both, the United States, China, and Japan, the story seems to want to recreate a situation where we redo World War II except Japan wins. I can say that one by one, the countries either fold or betray Japan. We talked about China already, but the Newton noble family and Joe himself, who run the Roman Federation, end up turning on Japan too for geopolitical reasons. Japan more or less ends up as being the only uh, good country standing. I can say that there's a German commander named Adolf. Adolf Reinhardt. Not to be confused with this Reinhardt from a show that's actually worth watching. Adolf, the German commander, sacrifices his life for his country, under attack and surrounded by all sides. Adolf, not a failed art student, Reinhard, married a woman who cheats on him with a very ethnic-looking Asian man? Adolf, does anyone else hear that dog whistle? Reinhard forgives his wife, only to find out later that their first son isn't theirs. The story makes sure to call her a whore and a slut in case you were wondering. Adolf, I'm not a Nazi, I'm an ultra-traditionalist who believes in strong borders. Reinhardt is told by his mother to never stop fighting for what he believes in, whatever that is. He's also an Aryan, who was born on Christmas, 
the fucking ship is literally called Annex 1. Like, let's Annex 1 Third World, please. How much more of the show must I consume to prove that this is just fashy nonsense? How how many chapters of the 200 plus manga chapters do I have to read? How many, how many sequels, how many prequels do I have to read? <sighs> Part 7. What is Terraformars, aka Steve Biko and where we go from here? So we've finally gotten to the point, TM. Terraformars is fascist propaganda written by a fascist, and despite the controversy that surrounded the show when it first aired, no one's cut on to this. Oh great, there the SJWs go again calling everyone a Nazi. No. I'm a writer, I choose my words pretty carefully. I disagree with Ben Shapiro, and you'll notice that in the section I talked about him, I never called him a fascist or a Nazi. This is deliberate, words have meaning. I don't think that Terraformers was written by a Nazi, it was written by a fascist. The Nazis, by successfully entering history as humanity's ultimate bad guys, often end up getting used as a petty insult. Your friend's a grammar Nazi because he's a dick on Twitter. Your physics professor was a total Nazi because she wouldn't even give you partial credit when you made that rounding error on the midterm. Liberals are Nazis because they don't want you misgendering people. This, coupled with the fact that U.S. history courses tend to focus on the history and the numbers behind the Nazi regime during World War II, and not the actual ideas that fueled this regime, where they come from, and how they still shape politics today, people don't have a good grasp as to what fascism is at the level of ideas. The fascists, of course, love this. They don't care if they have to drop the label fascist. They care about their ideas and if people are accepting them. If the mainstream hates fascism, but accepts all the core tenets of the ideology under words like identitarianism, race realism, chauvinism, or alt-right, that's fine for them. If people hate Adolf Hitler in the abstract, but ultimately seek to build society around his values, that's fine for them. Fascism is an ideology that maintains that humans can be split into distinct scientific races, it asserts that these races exist in an objective, universal hierarchy, where some races are more evolved than others. It asserts that the best way to organize society is for each race to have one or more nation-states, authoritarian governments which implement the will of the race they serve. Fascism is an ideology that maintains the superiority of masculinity over femininity and seeks to have female sexuality controlled. Fascism is concerned with the genetic strength of the race its nation-state serves. It seeks to purge genetic inferiority, race mixing, disabled people, the poor, and LGBT people from the population. If inferior races and populations must live within the nation, they must prove themselves by directly serving the needs and interests of the superior race. Fascism seeks to prevent the degeneration of the superior race by controlling, breeding, and culture through the state. Fascism is not exclusive to white people. Rather, in societies where white people hold the majority of the power and capital, fascism that holds the superiority of white people over others is especially dangerous. Fascism maintains that each nation-state is entitled to take whatever action it deems necessary to better its own population. It is inherently imperialist, in the sense that the conquest and exploitation by the strong nations of the weak will always be seen as natural. And always in fascism, there is a scapegoat a group of people who have betrayed the efforts of the fascists, a group to help explain why their side isn't winning. When I say Terraformers was written by a fascist, I'm saying it was written by someone who fundamentally shares this worldview. And when I say the story is fascist propaganda, I'm saying the events of the story are constructed to buy into those ideas, either in part or in full. Plenty of people have said that the story is racist. Plenty of people have pointed out it's obvious sexism. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thought this story is fascist to some degree, but I am one of the only ones to write about it. That means one or two things. Either I've gone off the deep end this early in my writing career, and I'll never be the same again. Or maybe we're bad at recognizing fascist messaging in our media. We're bad at recognizing when we're being propagandized to. Fascists and people with fascist sympathies have such a grip 
on otaku culture that any conversation in the opposite direction stops before we can get anywhere useful. Fascists have such control over otaku culture that fascists are seen as neutral centrists, apolitical people, even by people who, in any other context, would staunchly position themselves against this ideology. I've presented the history, the context, the source material, the facts, and my analysis in the best, most honest way I know how. A two-hour-long, profanity-laden audio essay plastered on some internet server I don't own. Steve Biko was a radical anti-apartheid activist. He died in prison at the age of 30 in 1977. While alive, Biko created the South African Students' Organization, a students group created to mobilize young black people into pressuring the South African regime into systemic change in the advancement of black people in the country. Through the SASO, Biko was at the head of a philosophy and movement known as Black Consciousness. Black Consciousness was a pan-African movement that asserted first and foremost that liberation for Black people cannot truly be achieved unless Black people lead the movements for change and set the terms for the end of oppression. In Biko's own words, I am not sneering at the liberals and their involvement, neither am I suggesting that they are the most to blame for the Black man's plight. Rather, I am illustrating the fundamental fact that total identification with an oppressed group in a system that forces one group to enjoy privilege and the other to live on the sweat of another is impossible. In South Africa, political power has always rested with white society. Not only have the whites been guilty of being on the offensive, but by some skillful maneuvers, they have managed to control the response of the blacks to the provocation. Not only have they kicked the black, but they have also told him how to react to the kick. He is now beginning to show signs that it is his right and his duty to respond to the kick in the way he sees fit. The call for black consciousness is the most positive call to come from any group in the black world for a long time. It is more than just a reactionary rejection of whites white blacks. The quintessence of it is the realization by the blacks that in order to feature well in this game of power politics, they have to use the concept of group power and to build a strong foundation for this. This goes without saying, but struggling to overthrow one of the most evil forms of government on the face of the planet, and like, anime being bad, are not remotely comparable. I don't want this essay to do anything more than it already does to entertain, to educate, and to warn about the intersections between pop culture and politics. However, there is an idea of Biko's that I think works well in what we've talked about so far. 2014's Gamergate allowed the far right to openly colonize the internet, and they've especially taken advantage of nerd communities, communities known to have an overrepresentation of cishet white men. I'm not saying that Weebdom was a stateless, classless, moneyless utopia before Gamergate or anything. But the connection between anime culture and reactionary politics was far, far more blurry. It's perhaps always been hard for minority groups to express their concerns in anime spaces, but I think it's safe to say that Gamergate has turned anime fandom, as well as gaming, comic books, movie fandom, and many, many, many more fandoms into spaces that are openly hostile to anti-fascist, anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist ideas. What's needed is a new consciousness in nerd culture. We need to start choosing how we react to these kicks. Not just a black consciousness, but one that encompasses all the people and all the ideas the alt-right has been working so, so very hard to repress. We can't expect that consciousness to come from the anime establishment, so to speak. The overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly straight, overwhelmingly male politics of mainstream anime fandom will never recognize something like Terraformers as something that merits a debate, let alone a problem. This new consciousness needs to instead come from us, from the people who stand the most to lose, from the alt-right co-opting our hobbies to make it harder for us to live in our own countries. It's long past time we stop tolerating media that hates us. It's long past time we stop letting people who are the least affected by the proliferation of fascist ideology tell us when we're being too sensitive or when things are just jokes. It's long past time that we tell the people who want to keep politics out of their hobbies that it's always been political. 
It's always been political for the gay and trans people who are mocked through caricature and fetishization. It's always been political for the women who have to watch their experiences with sexual harassment and assault be made light of, encouraged, and sexualized. It's always been political for the black and brown people who are constantly told that they're inferior and that the world would be better off without us. We don't have to stand for this shit anymore. Part 8. Conclusion So here's a question out of the blue. You're a writer. How do you make an army stronger? I've been pretty critical of reactionary fans of problematic anime hyper-focusing on the apolitical, on the aesthetic, on the core mechanics of functional storytelling in anime as a way to avoid discussion and criticism of the types of media we consume and trust. However, for this last point, we're going to need to take off our revolutionary hats and look at Terraformars from a purely mechanical lens. The plot of Terraformars more or less doesn't exist. The enjoyment of the series is hedged almost entirely around the threat of the Martian Roche people themselves. The characters need to survive wave after wave of violent mobs that know nothing but to kill. It's a standard thriller, mechanically speaking, of course. Nothing standard about it at all, politically speaking. Anyway, the villain of the series swaps hands between various political factions that stand in the way of Japan's national interests. However, THE villain, TM, is this ever-present army of terraformers. The issue with villains is that if you see them around too much, it gets harder and harder to justify why the heroes should ever be afraid of them, especially if the heroes always win. If the villain of this story was a single person, we could do a rivalry where both the hero and the villain are constantly growing and getting stronger, and thus we can't know which character is going to win on the next encounter. The Terraformars aren't a single person, they're an army. How do you make an army stronger? Maybe we could just make the army bigger? Maybe. But the story blows its load on this front way too early, we're effectively told that there's an infinite number of these creatures on Mars. The Martian Roche people never mourn their dead or otherwise fight in a way that conserves their troops or resources, they just attack, attack, attack in huge swarms. What else can you do? Well, in a nutshell, the army needs to get better at killing. Maybe the army finds a new weapon that's a lot stronger than anything the heroes have. Maybe the army has improved its organization. Maybe its soldiers fight with a new form of martial arts. To do any of this requires the army be capable of growth. To do any of this requires the army be human. Terraformars spends a lot of effort through its dialogue and framing to dehumanize the Terraformars and, by extension, people of color. These people must be subhuman, the show argues, so that they can be purged from existence for the benefit of the real humans, the Aryan master race, its Japanese equivalent, and a handful of other minorities that have proven themselves to be one of the good ones. Yet, to continue the plot, the Roche people must be humanized. Over time, we learn to have complex social structures, understand technology, are capable of learning science, are capable of formulating battle plans. Some even learn to speak human languages. If the Terraformars are intelligent enough to be a threat, are they not also intelligent enough to be reasoned with? How are the Roche people both smart enough to constantly threaten the existence of the master races, yet be too primitive and inhuman to aspire to be anything more than killing machines? How is their wholesale slaughter justified when, as the story progresses, we see them act and feel as humans do? This contradiction is at the core of all fascist movements. The Jews, Muslims, Central Americans, Koreans, Chinese, African Slavs, gays, whoever else, are all too degenerate, too uncivilized, and too undeveloped to run their own societies. Yet, if we let them into our countries, their mere existence is enough to destroy our way of life. They're so sophisticated and organized, they can single-handedly end civilization. As Italian thinker Umberto Eco put it in his essay, Eternal Fascism, 14 Ways of Looking at a Black Shirt, the followers of fascism must be convinced that they can overwhelm the enemy. Thus, by a continuous shifting of rhetorical focus, the enemies are at the same time too strong and too weak. In this specific case, mechanical storytelling and ideology become one and the same. Sure, fascism is always contradictory, but 
Terraformars is forced to contradict its own world building, dialogue, and aesthetic for the story to be anywhere close to enjoyable. It is mathematically impossible for this story to be good. It was always doomed to be a self-defeating mess from the start. And that's just glorious. I think it says something else, too. It can be discouraging to look at the world, see the rise in right-wing politics around the world, especially in the face of destabilizing geopolitics and climate refugees. Fascists work to make us feel unwelcome where we ought to belong. They work to question our abilities, our worth, and our claims to equality. But the fact is, anytime fascists do so much as breathe, this same contradiction exists in the back of their heads. The fact that they're so afraid of us, the fact that they hate us enough to want us gone, is in and of itself proof of our worth. To be a fascist is to acknowledge that your so-called enemies are intelligent and capable enough to defeat you. And to be afraid as a fascist is to acknowledge that your enemies are just as human as anyone else. If you like this any, the first person I have to thank is utrainoff 17 over on Reddit. They were the one that gave me the idea, and now it's a thing. I was actually almost about to not do this essay. Terraformers was just so glaringly obvious and awful that I assumed that someone had already done something like this in the years this property has been public. But, nope. So I had to do it to him. You know this, fans. As usual, I'd like to thank Raghava Kovuli slash Krannis Angel for reading this over. I'm not sure who's been holding the record for best human right now, but they're about to yoink it from you. Try being a little less awesome sometime around, dude. It's hard to compete with. This next treatise is not Fire Force. If you're backing me on Patreon, you'd already know this because I did an update about it. Basically, Fire Force sucks and is bad. More specifically, while it's problematic in some areas and impressive in others, it's not consistent enough in terms of quality or theme work to do much of a treatise with. There sure are a lot of isekai this season though, huh? Fall 2019 is like, what, 600 of them? I've got a Frankfurt School vs. Isekai treatise floating around in my head. Instead of roasting a single anime, I'ma end an entire genre. It'll be great. Or not. We'll see. So, if you've got an Isekai or any other story where a person from the real world gets stuck in another world, yes, I'm counting Western media in this, that you'd like to maybe see reviewed, send it my way, and maybe you'll see me write about it all smug-like. I've already got... The hero is overpowered but overly cautious, ReZero, starting life in another world, Sword Art Online, and 
Didn't I say to make my abilities average in the next life? On the watch list, as well as the American webcomic Earthworld. Don't give me Shield Hero, though. I, I did that. That train has passed. And speaking of stuff I've done, check the description. Make sure to follow me on Medium and YouTube. If I have to plug myself anymore, I might just fall over. So that's it for now. See ya.